Jeff, uh, co-director, and Nicholas, the, the other one. Um, uh, so yeah, tonight uh, we're, we're kicking off a, a new series called X Cities. Um, we like to have uh, puns on X whenever, whenever possible. Uh, and uh, so this is this is a one in a series of five uh, where uh, Greg Lindsay and Anthony Townsend are going to be hosting, uh, organizing, and uh, moderating a series of conversations and discussions over the next two months, um, looking at. Broadly speaking, uh, the, the idea of smart cities, but uh, I'd, I'd probably phrase it a little bit more ambiguously about where data, where information technology, um, uh, where those come together or intersect with urbanization. Um, if the two, or if, if you guys don't know the two of, two of them, uh, uh, you should. Uh, they're both uh, really fascinating thinkers and, and writers on on the on the city. Um, Greg is most recently the co-author of uh, Aerotropolis: The Way We'll Live Next. Um, that's co-written with uh, John Casarda at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and it's yeah, effectively look at the sort of the gonzo intersection of uh, airports and and the future of urbanism and uh, transportation. Um, Greg has probably beaten Watson, the uh, IBM Jeopardy computer. Um, so I, I don't think he'll be talking about that this evening. But um, only if you want to. Anthony will. Um, and then Anthony is a, is a works at the uh, Institute for the Future. Uh, and has a, a pretty broad and, and impressive background in um, urban studies. Uh, PhD, MA, MBA, all in urban studies, including a, a minor in physics uh, when he was getting his BA. And um, they both have, uh, yeah, I'd say, broad focus on um, IT, data, transportation, and uh, and urbanism. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to them to kick off the conversation, which is a look at uh, both top-down and bottom-up uh, planning in the future of smart cities. So cool, thanks. Thanks, Jeff, uh, Nicola, and everybody that's come out tonight. Um, I've been kind of knee-deep in writing a book about this stuff for the last two months, so I haven't done any public speaking. Uh, I'm Jeff, uh, co-director, and Nicholas, the, the other one. Um, uh, so yeah, tonight uh, we're, we're kicking off a, a new series called X Cities. Um, we like to have uh, puns on X when, whenever possible. Uh, and uh, so this is this is a one in a series of five uh, where uh, Greg Lindsay and Anthony Townsend are going to be hosting, uh, organizing, and uh, moderating a series of conversations and discussions over the next two months, um, looking at. Broadly speaking, uh, the, the idea of smart cities, but uh, I'd, I'd probably phrase it a little bit more ambiguously about where data, where information technology, um, uh, where those come together or intersect with urbanization. Um, if the two, or if, if you guys don't know the two of two of them, uh, uh, you should. Uh, they're both uh, really fascinating thinkers and, and writers on on the on the city. Um, Greg is most recently the co-author of uh, Aerotropolis: The Way We'll Live Next. Um, that's co-written with uh, John Casarda at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and it's yeah, effectively look at the sort of the gonzo intersection of uh, airports and and the future of urbanism and uh, transportation. Um, Greg has probably beaten Watson, the uh, IBM Jeopardy computer. Um, so I, I don't think he'll be talking about that this evening. But um, only if you want to. Anthony will. Um, and then Anthony is a, is a works at the uh, Institute for the Future. Uh, and has a, a pretty broad and, and impressive background in um, urban studies. Uh, PhD, MA, MBA, all in urban studies, including a, a minor in physics uh, when he was getting his BA. And um, they both have, uh, yeah, I'd say, broad focus on um, IT, data, transportation, and uh, and urbanism. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to them to kick off the conversation, which is a look at uh, both top-down and bottom-up uh, planning in the future of smart cities. So cool, thanks. Thanks, Jeff, uh, Nicola, and everybody that's come out tonight. Um, I've been kind of knee-deep in writing a book about this stuff for the last two months, so I haven't done any public speaking. Um, which is unusual, so it may take me a little while to get out of the gate, but Greg is like the consummate fast-talking New Yorker, so hopefully um, hopefully we will keep you on your toes. So. Um, don't groan when I put this up here, because I'm so sick of hearing this at urban planning conferences, but as you all know, the world is now more than 50% urbanized, right? Okay, so this is, this is one of the trends shaping the 21st century. Um, about the same time that that happened, we also pass over the five billion mark in terms of people connected to digital networks of any kind, mostly cell phone voice networks, but text networks, the internet, etc. cetera. Um, there's now more mobile brand broadband connections than fixed connections. Again, this happened around the same time in 2008 that all these other magical things happened. And there's now more things online than people. Um, so. There's five billion people connected. There's more than five billion vehicles 
uh, network sensors, um, you know, everyday household objects connected to the internet. So these things are sort of happening at the same time and are really shaping um, what our cities are going to look like. This spread of ubiquitous computing is the context, the dominating context for urbanization. And so a lot of people have been talking about this in industry, um, in uh, uh, the grassroots technology community, um, in city hall. You know, public officials are trying to understand what does it mean that we're building and rebuilding cities, um, and this is sort of the new toolkit that we have. Um, you know, planning and architecture have moved along with fits and starts for a century, um, but this is the big new thing coming in, and there's a lot of people from outside architecture, planning, urban design that have ideas about how to rebuild cities. And um, as these two trends come together, it's sort of come to this conversation that people just call it smart, smart cities, right? That's the label that's being stuck on this big box of things that's in, at the intersection there. Um, but that's, that's what it is. It's not what it means. So what happens you know, over here at the, at the other side as we come out of um, this box of making smart things, making cities smart by tricking them out with all kinds of technology? And for us, that's, this is what the X is. It's this X where ubiquitous computing and urbanization are coming together. Um, what does X mean? Um, I was so happy today to find out that even Mark Wigley, the dean here at Columbia, doesn't know. Um, in an interview he gave from Metropolis last month about Studio X, he said, the X means we don't know what's going to happen. And I don't think Greg and I claim to know what's going to happen either. Um, but we want to have a conversation about it that goes beyond you know, what the toolkit is, uh, because everyone's so bogged down in talking about the toolkit. So what we've done is put together a series that's sort of loosely um, based on a forecast that I did two years ago for the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, it was called Plan of Civic Laboratories. That was specifically looking at um, what information technology meant for the urban poor all over the world. Um, but in that forecast, we kind of broke down the opportunities uh, at this intersection into four big strategic areas. Governance, innovations, planning, design, interventions, uh, and then things that you can do using market-based or commons-based approaches. And we're sort of going to structure the series uh, and have one session that kind of dives into each of these and looks at, you know, like different opposing approaches. So, um, you know, in terms of, of measuring cities, uh, do you take a top-down approach like an IBM and go in and put all these sensors in and pump it all back into City Hall? Uh, or do you use a, a much more grassroots approach um, like the UN is using, looking at, you know, self-reporting and s surveying of people through their mobile phones? So we really want to tease out like what the, the extremes are uh, of different strategies in all these areas. Some of it's going to be about design, uh, some of it's going to be about planning, some of it's going to be about policy, and some of it's going to be about things that have nothing to do um, with any of those, and startups and, and industry and things like that. So I think it'll be really interesting. We have a great uh, set of speakers lined up that we're going to bring in, uh, and we'll be announcing shortly. We're just trying to put the finishing touches on it. Um, but what we want to do today is kind of lay out like the big bow, right? What, what is the case for SMART? Why even think about this? Why not um, you know, study 19th century French literature and let that you know, help you think about reinventing the city? Um, and we're going to do this in um, two different thrusts. Um, Greg is going to uh, present the sort of top-down approach, which you might think of as like the intelligent design approach to creating smart cities. He's done an amazing job over the last couple of years um, reporting on what IBM and Cisco and Siemens and all these big companies are doing um, and sort of how they see cities um, unfolding. And then I'm going to come back and give the sort of bottom-up um, organic approach um, driven by startups and hackers and, and um, city government. So uh, I'll turn it over to Brad. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Jeff and Nicola. Thank you all for coming. Um, Cues up the next set of slides. Mm -hmm. um, you know, t touching off a point of, of, uh, of Anthony, we both sort of bring different interests to this as well. In, in addition to bringing together, you know, ubiquitous computing and cities, you know, with the with the advent of this, you're seeing basically software culture come into the city as well. I mean, you know, in terms of urban planning and architecture, there is this sort of traditional school of urbanists um, who approached the Jane Jacobs tradition and and, uh, and how we sort of see the city. And now what's interesting to me and what's been the thrust a lot about my reporting about it is, is that now you're seeing what happens when Microsoft and IBM decide that they know how to build the city better than anyone because, of course, 
uh, they know how to write software. They've mastered Moore's law. I mean, you know, there's a there's a dictum around now that you know every company is a software company, um, and you're seeing software and technology companies, uh, you know, sort of uh, enabled uh, by the fact that they're profitable and large and, uh, and seen as you know can do no evil in the case of Google, um, that are attempting to sort of move, I think, beyond their field of expertise. Um, and so I'm starting to drift into the top, the bottom up approach here. But uh, tonight I'm going to sort of argue in favor of the top down model. Why? What is what is the rationale for IBM and others? Um, to argue that their approach is best. Um, and really, you know, when we talk about the whole notion of the smart city, it really does start with sort of IBM there because uh, before they launched the Smarter Planet campaign, two days after President Obama was elected in 2008 in the nadir of the recession, the crisis right then, um, no one was talking about smart cities. It was a tradition that had gone back alternately, you know, to the 80s, you know, with ubiquitous computing. Mark Weiser at uh, Xerox Park was a researcher who started to imagine what it would be like if you had no interface, no, you know, no touch screen at all know nothing uh, to access computing. You would simply be in your environment. And that sort of languished for 20 years until IBM and its marketing team put together this sort of massive rationale as to why governments, companies uh, should invest you know, billions if not trillions of dollars in this and why, why, and why we as citizens should go along with it. If you pay close attention, you'll notice that those ubiquitous IBM Smarter Planet ads have never sold a single product. They're selling you as a voter and as a citizen and, and basically trying to win you over to enable them to go into our governments and go into companies and sort of make this change happen. So with that as sort of a backdrop, this is a slide of a forest. This is a, not actually what looks like stubble. This is a very high aerial shot of a, of a tree plantation, of silviculture. Um, there's a great book called Seeing Like a State by Yale's uh, James C. Scott, where he basically sort of lambasts the notion of as I said, seeing as a state. The notion of seeing everything with sort of a hard, clear geometry, of seeing from a sort of centralized, top-down approach, um, and sort of ignoring local practice and custom, um, and sort of going in there. And, and you know, his example of urbanism is, of course, Brasilia, um, you know, the Brazilian capital created by, uh, by Oscar Niemeyer and, um, I forget the, the uh, Lucio Costa, um, which is of course the great failure of modernist urban planning. A city that is beautiful, that is photographed all over, and is such an inhuman scale um, that you know that basically its first generation of residents were traumatized by it. Um, and so that's sort of the traditional you know approach to monoculture. In the same book, Scott goes after silviculture and tree plantations as a, as your sort of classic crop monoculture, more prone to disease, more prone to you know total destruction, um, the sort of classic uh, version of fragility versus a uh, up sort of bottom-up forest. Um, what's interesting is that you know in another book in uh, in Jared Diamond's Collapse, he actually looks at tree plantations uh, as a way out of a basically resource collapse and and decline. Um, in his book, Diamond looks at the Tokugawa shogunate of Japan in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, basically, Japan at, at that time was headed towards a total deforestation collapse. It already lost you know entire forests on on Honshu, um, and the whole system was about to go out of whack until. One of the visionary shoguns actually basically rigidly codified how much wood you could harvest, what wood you could harvest. They began those sort of very object cultivation of various trees and basically sort of mastered their forest environment. Um, and Diamond concludes very, very favorably in his book that it was this top-down approach, this visionary leadership in its truest form, is what basically saved Japan from a fate similar to Haiti. Um, and so to me, this is really interesting because both of these approaches are, are, are arguably, you know, are arguably valid, you know, this interpretation of this. Um, and, but mine, the top-down model, is, is basically arguing in favor of, of leadership and, and uh, conservation. Because today, it's the, there's basically three crises going on, is what I would argue. And this is the sort of rationale behind an IBM or a Cisco or Living Planet, um, some of the various companies that I've, uh, I've spoken to at length, and we'll hopefully have speakers from them uh, later in the series. Um, the first crisis is, is urbanization. And, um, and sure enough, you know, to, to Anthony's point, uh, you know, the world is in fact more than half urbanized. Um, the second is environmental, and the third is financial. And we'll, we'll go sort of in a piece. Um, you know, to, to get through the sort of the notion of of, of, of urbanization, um, this is a chart I pulled this from um, uh, from Sully Angel at NYU, who's, uh, who's at the Wagner School of Urban Planning. There, if you look to the bottom, you can see that in 2000, you know, the world's urban population was 2.8 billion. It's going to more than double by 2050. Um, and here you can see to see the various rates. I mean, the average rate, average rise is two percent a year. Um, and then in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, it's rising much, much faster. Um, and so, you know, not only we, can we expect uh, urban population to double uh, in the next 40 years, but we can also expect urban land cover to more than triple. 
Um, these are showing the curves depending on density rates. Um, Sully Angel, his, my favorite calculation of his is that he calculated that urban density peaked somewhere around 1894, and that basically cities have becoming less, become less dense by an average of 2% every year ever since. Um, and that's why you end up with sort of, you know, if you want to see what that looks like now to date, um, you can look at Accra, Ghana in 1985 and again in 2000, 15 years, you know, a massive expansion of land cover. Um, and you can look at Bangkok, you know, over the last 150 years, um, another massive expansion expansion and land cover. So frankly, we need to, we need to build something, um, but, uh, but you know, it's a question of how much can you build and when can you build it? And, um, and basically, one of the, uh, the, if you want to talk about sort of top, uh, or I'm sorry, bottom-up urbanism, the, the classic example of bottom-up urbanism is sprawl. Um, and not even sprawl in the suburban sense, uh, but this kind of sprawl, a sort of mass uh, profusion of informal settlements, slums, and, uh, and basically sort of slash and burn into the surrounding countryside uh, to carve out what you can have. Now, you know, the problem with this sort of urbanization, the sort of bottom-up version of sprawl, is that it runs smack dab into the next crisis, which is the environmental one. Um, you know, the, uh, the last couple of years, the, uh, you know, the International Energy Agency, uh, which is uh, paid for by the OECD, um, has estimated that basically peak oil will happen in 2020, and that's when uh, liquid reserves will start falling. It doesn't touch upon the tar sands or, or any, uh, anything else, but this is the most conservative source available, and they say that peak oil will happen in 2020, and then just in the past few months, they basically argued that unless we begin cutting carbon emissions immediately, 2017 is the point of no return for basically permanent temperature rise. Um, so we are basically running out of time. We're going to have a massively urbanizing environment in the next 40 years. Um, the pace of urbanization that we have now is massively unsustainable, um, and it will trigger these sort of incredible effects that will either cause us to, you know, basically lose our ability to have liquid fuels uh, or trigger a permanent climate change or both. Um, and there's that stat for Anthony, although I did a ticket up to 51% of population. <laughs> so what's interesting is, is that basically, yes, yeah, cities are the site of this environmental crisis. Um, you know, they occupy 51% of population, but they consume 60 to 80% of all energy on the planet and emit 75% of greenhouse gases. Um, now, there's a whole interesting counterbody of research about urbanization, you know, the notion that cities will save the world. Stuart Brand has looked at slums. Um, you know, we can argue about, you know, the, the basically the economic uplifting of people and creating opportunity where there is none. And that's absolutely what cities do. Um, but at the same time, it seems sort of unequivocal here that basically cities, the move from the, from the rural village and the farm to cities increases your energy intensity. Um, and so, you know, as we urbanize the planet, we're going to see, you know, a continuing rise in, in energy. And of course, the percentage will go up as well. Um, and the third crisis is financial. Um, basically, this is all happening at a moment when, of course, we have governments with austerity budgets. Um, you know, Greece has been imminently about to collapse in the Eurozone for the last year, it seems. Um, and so this is a stat from, uh, from Booz and Company on a study they did. Uh, the graph on the left basically shows, uh, you know, sort of cumulative carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2040. Um, and the stat that isn't on there is that uh, there's estimates that basically once you hit 870, um, by, if, you, if you hit 870 gigatons by 2050, um, it's sort of all over its day after Tomorrowland. Um, and their estimates show that we're going to reach more than, we'll be more than halfway there, I'm sorry, by 2100, that's what will happen, and we'll be more than halfway there by 2040. Um, but the, stat, the, the, the graph on the right is the one I find really interesting. The, their statistics have found that we're going to cumulatively spend $350 trillion on building cities, operating them, and maintaining them um, between 2010 and 2040, um, which makes sense considering the urbanization rates and the urban land cover rates. Now, basically, their argument is this, is that, you know, if you use technology, which is, you know, you know, basically computing IT, the only thing that can possibly keep pace in terms of improvement with this mass urbanization and climate change, thanks to Moore's Law and a host of other sort of technology improvements, is that basically if you invest in IT now, you will realize savings later. The classic sort of efficiency argument. One of their stats is, is that uh, if you invest, uh, you know, $22 billion in IT in, in, in given environments at the moment in the next 10 years, um, your net savings will be $33 billion. Um, it's basically an argument that if you if you work with leadership now and you think strategically about what you're going to need, it will pay off in the end rather than sort of groping towards bottom up, um, seeing how you can improve this environment. Um, and what's interesting, if you want to see what, ha what happens when you sort of merge all of these three crises together, or sort of three trends, um, you sort of get this map of Seoul, you know, 1972, 1989. Um, Seoul has a green belt, um, and not to mention mountains around it, which sort of limits urban expansion. Um, so now it's only become massively densified in the core, but it's consumed every bit of land that it can. And now they've begun constructing islands off the coast of Korea. Um, and one of these islands, which, uh, which Anthony has been to and studied at length, is Songdo, uh, which is the sort of the prototypical 
typical example of mm -hmm. the, the, the smart city, or the X-City, as we'll call it, uh, that's being built today. Um, this is the world's uh, most, private, most expensive privately developed real estate project in the world, $35 billion. It's built on a man-made island and landfill off the coast of Korea, um, and it won't be done for another 10 years or so. Um, and basically, you know, they were chartered by the government of Korea in 2002 to create this as a smart city because uh, Korea, like many others, the ROK, um, believed that, you know, that ubiquitous computing and smart cities would be its version of Silicon Valley. They would specialize in this and take over the world. Um, and it didn't turn out to be that easy. Um, and so a few years ago, uh, they basically signed a deal, the developers of this American company called Gale International, with Cisco uh, to bring this in. This was a few months, actually, after IBM announced its Smarter Planet campaign, sort of stole the march on everyone else. Um, and so Cisco is now using Songdo as sort of, you know, its test bed uh, for the smart, smart city solutions of tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, if, whatever you read about smart cities, X cities, uh, Songdo always comes up, including in my own, own work. Um, now, I do want to say here, because this is sort of, if we're going to do this debate style, I think Anthony's uh, clearest line of attack on the top-down argument are the absurd cities it produces. Not to mention Songdo, but also, you know, Sino-Singapore Tianjin eco-city rendered here. You know, where they're going to build this on sort of like a mud flat outside Tianjin, or on the edge of Tianjin, which is, you know, the sort of equivalent of Gary, Indiana of China. Um, and so, you know, you'll have this happy here. Or, you know, on the other side of Beijing is Mentu City, which hopefully, again, wants to be China's ecological Silicon Valley. Valley, because don't we all? Um, this is proposed to be 50,000 people. Uh, this was done by Finnish architects, their proposal. Um, you know, and of course, the most famous version of these uh, is Mazdar, you know, the zero carbon city in the middle of UAE, which is, of course, you know, the highest uh, cap carbon emissions per capita in the entire world, the only country ahead of the Americans. Um, and of course, Mazdar, you know, has, has taken a step back in this. Uh, you know, they, uh, they originally was going to be zero carbon. Now, uh, I forget how they've, they've backed down from there, but, uh, but basically, their solution to building the city of tomorrow was to build a wall around it, and then everything inside would be totally carbon-free. Um, I bring all these up because I, because I think it's a wrong thing to do, is to, is to basically say that all of these cities, which are all sort of toy cities, is an argument against why the top-down model can't work. They're all designed to be prototypes. They are all designed to be test beds for what is the future of tomorrow, and not necessarily all the people who are building them know what they're doing. Um, the UAE might be the clearest example. Um, but one of the, you know, but there is a whole sort of, a, there's merits to some of the more interesting ones here. This is a, the last one of these, Planet Valley Portugal. This is more metaphorical. Um, this is a sort of another privately developed smart city, uh, X city from the, from the bottom up, uh, by four Microsoft executives. And in their case, they are planning to basically build uh, a true city in the cloud. You know, they basically imagine, you know, that you will junk smart buildings the moment they become obsolete and their technology goes offline. Um, and they're working with the government of Portugal. But uh, like Mazdar and like the others, their ultimate goal is to build the prototype city, smart city, City, X city of tomorrow, and then export it to China, which is where all of these projects would like to go. So, um, so I'd like to touch upon sort of three rationales here. I don't know how much of an argument I made, but I'm sort of laying out the sort of you know why this is happening and why you know these various companies are laying claim to that we have to do something right now, and it's incredibly important that we do so rather than waiting for the sort of trickle-up effect. Um, and so, three quick arguments, essentially. One is, one is process transformation. One is that, is that basically the X-City phenomenon looks less like the web in some ways than it does about, basically, um, enterprise software and sort of what it enables you to do as a mayor or as a government or as a company, how you can use it to affect change and do leadership. That basically the software is an, is an enabling tool, not the point of this. Um, the second is the cathedral versus the bazaar, uh, you know, the, the classic example of Linux versus Microsoft. Now I think it's sort of Linux versus Apple and what those models tell us. And the third is the return of planning. Um, since Jane Jacobs, it's been almost taboo to describe yourself as an urban planner. And I think that the top-down approach to smart cities um, is the powerful planning tool that planners have been waiting for. Um, so the first example of process transformation is this. This is the operations center in Rio, uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, created by IBM. Um, if you see the film Urbanized, this makes a, a brief cameo appearance where the mayor of Rio, Eduardo Pérez, um, says things like, my screen is bigger than NASA's and uh, I can see everyone from here, um, which does not make those of us who worry about Big Brother feel reassured. Um, but what's interesting about this project, you know, is, is that basically it started as a weather detection system. Um, Pez, uh, in April 2010, there was a series of mudslides that killed hundreds of people in, on the hillsides uh, where the favelas had been built. Um, and so eager to, to not have a repeat of that, Pez went to IBM, with whom we already had a relationship, and commissioned them to build a sort of early weather detection system for storms that might dump, you know, uh, uh, literally two feet of rain in, a, in 
I think it was like a 24 hour period or a foot of rain 24 hour period. It was a freak storm that wasn't detected by any of the city's weather agencies. And so this very modest project, you know, started with some sort of software and it started with a radar array and, and various maps, GIS data. Um, but what's interesting about it is, is that the sort of core of the process uh, as IBM's uh, chief technology officer of Smarter Planet, uh, Guru Bonavar, who will hopefully be joining us uh, in a couple sessions, um, and we'll talk about this project, is that basically what it enabled what it enabled Payas to do is it enabled him to basically connect departments of the city that had never been connected before. Um, it allowed him, it gave him the opportunity, it gave him the technology to basically start rewiring the city to actually address the challenges that it had. And what's fascinating to me is, as I spoke and I wrote a piece about this in uh, December 2010, and today if you Google uh, you know, Rio Operations Center, you'll see a piece that the, the Daily Beast wrote, um, where the operation has expanded massively in size. That basically every city agency now reports into this operations center, which is getting real-time data from across the city from 800, 800 uh, television cameras from drones actually overhead uh, during the favelas um, and basically has sort of knit together city agencies in a way that could never have been done. And I think what's really powerful about this approach to it is not the, the troubling big brother aspects, but they are definitely there. Um, it's how Pez has basically been able to use the technology to rewire his city bureaucracy in one of the world's most sprawling uh, uh, mega cities, one that is hosting both the World Cup and the Olympics, um, to basically affect change in it. And this is sort of what's been going on inside companies with enterprise software for two decades. Um, is that basically, you know, you use this sort of software to rationalize processes and rewire your company and pull it together. And I think this is sort of one of the powers of the top-down approach. And not only can you do this with cities or with companies, but you can do this in theory with countries. Uh, this is a, a line, this is a Cisco's head of emerging markets here. Um, it'll take you a while to, work, to, to get through that, but this is a, a, a program they had called for a while, Country Transformation, until they realized how Orwellian it sounded. Uh, which was basically the idea that you know, Cisco realized that it could not do business in a great number of emerging economies because they simply weren't, their network infrastructure wasn't developed enough. And you know, this is sort of, I think, goes back to sort of the notion of, you know, if you come in as a Cisco, or you come in as a government and you have these goals and you want this infrastructure, this is sort of, you know, that sets the stage for how to do it. Um, Cisco will come into your country and will help you wire it up to achieve, you know, your education, to create your Silicon Valley as they're doing in Saudi Arabia, whatever, but it basically is an excuse to basically bring up your network infrastructure and your basics to the level at which you can even support bottoms up uh, uh, smart city innovation. Because until you do this, you have nothing. Um, and so at the very least, a top down approach is necessary to even bring some of the frontier markets and developing countries um, to the point where they're able to actually build a smart city. Um, sort of in the same vein, you know, you could basically see what's interesting is that you know a lot of these companies, this is from Living Planet, are, are actually sort of seeing you know how they can rethink the environment in terms of software. So this is one of their network diagrams. Um, this is another. They're basically you know it's a, this is their platform for the urban operating system as they call it. They're trying to trademark this, but they won't get away with it. Um, but you know, in talking to Living Planet, which is a very, very hungry startup, um, basically what they're trying to do, as you'll see in the next screen, is trying to build cities in the construction industry like you would build a software company. Um, they're investing millions of their own money and millions more of their partners to basically try to rationalize um, how you sort of build cities. In the sense of, you know, they looked at the construction industry, and I have to pull up the stats, but you know, but 65% of construction materials are thrown in landfills or otherwise broken or written off. Um, you know, what we think of in terms of the housing industry in the United States is a massively broken from a sustainability standpoint and from an efficiency standpoint. Um, and so what they're trying to do with their top-down approach is basically, this is a pattern of, you know, you recognize this if you spent any time looking at software company business plans, is to basically apply this to the city itself, to find business models for cities um, and find new business models for how you construct them. Um, and so, you know, this is, a, this is one attempt to basically sort of figure out how do you rationalize it and bring sort of order to it. Um, and this is sort of ties into, you know, the whole notion of how do you build software. Um, the internet is always held up as an example of a sort of bottom-up ecosystem of standards and everything else that went from there, um, but that's not really happening in the smart city market right now. There is no TCP IP for smart cities, except maybe TCP IP itself. Um, in talking to, you know, to one of Cisco's top execs, um, he exclaimed to me, you know, in sort of awe, he felt like he was back in the early 90s because there are no standards for how you build a smart city. There are no data models. There are no protocols. There is no way to efficiently build in the time frame that we need a kind of smart city technology. Um, and so it's left to companies like Cisco and IBM and Living Planet to start building these software modules and start building these protocols. And in the case of Living Planet, you know, they want to build the urban operating system that talks to 
to all the various pieces that its partners put together. Um, and the one interesting factoid about theirs is, is that it's actually based on McLaren's technology, which is the software that actually sends car telemetry from Formula One race cars. So if they have their way, they will basically save the world by using Formula One telemetry to, uh, to basically build uh, X cities. Um, the second argument I want to get to is, and this is a brief one, the last two are relatively brief, um, is the cathedral versus the bazaar. And, um, and if, you're, if you're familiar with software at all and software writing, um, the cathedral and the bazaar is a famous essay written by Eric Raymond sometime in the early to mid 90s, um, basically about Linux and why Linux could work as an operating system. Um, and basically his argument was is that you know all bugs are shallow and you have an infinite pool of developers uh, and you can infinitely outsource it. I mean, all the sort of arguments are bottom up. Um, that basically, you know, you could build a cathedral, uh, a combined a closed operating system um, that had a sort of elegance to it, but ultimately it would not be as efficient and it would not move fast enough as a sort of bottom-up uh, bizarre approach to it. Um, which is true in so many software companies, except for one, the reason I had this up there is this is the ultimate example of, of the cathedral approach, is Apple's complete hardware software integration, um, sort of complete dictation of the form of it. There is only one variety of iPod as opposed to uh, say, you know, how many Blackberries you can get at this point of smartphones. And even though there is a sort of free ecosystem on top of it with the apps that's also very rigidly controlled. And this is not exactly infrastructure either. This is a, a sort of middle layer where this is the interface, this is the, this is the selling point, this is the sex appeal. It is, you know, you don't think of any individual apps really when you buy an iPhone, if you buy an iPhone. You think of the elegance of the platform itself. And this is going to be absolutely necessary if we're going to try to push sort of widespread embrace uh, of smart cities, of X cities to people. And um, without saying too much of talking out of school, I know there was one company of, of, who are, Anthony and I both know, um, they were both working on a sort of very small scale uh, urban operating system approach for Chicago. Um, and talks recently broke down, they fell apart. And, and one of the reasons they did was is because the company in question could not get enough funding to make it work perfectly straight out of the gate. Um, the person I talked to who worked there basically said, you cannot, you cannot do a phased approach. You cannot release a beta test version of this and get people on the street to embrace it. It has to be perfect the first time or they will never embrace a sort of smart city. And, and Apple and the iPhone is a living embodiment of this. There are no buggy versions of it. Um, you need to present the sort of finished perfect product if you're to basically create the, uh, the sort of adoption needed in the kind of time frame allowed. The last minor point I'll make in favor of top down um, is sort of the return of planning. Um, so, you know, this is another IBM product that I wrote about. Um, this is sort of their smart city in a box. Uh, IBM basically realized that their original business plan was, uh, was flawed in the sense of when they launched Smarter Planet, they thought governments would have all the money and corporations would be broke. Instead, it is the opposite approach. So now they're coming up with software that allows cities to basically do sort of smart city stuff uh, on, a, on a limited budget. Um, and so, you know, despite all that we'll talk about in the series with the Orwellian versions of massive control rooms and everything else, this is really one of the more modest applications of, of IBM smart city technology, which is in this case, it's basically to help the planners of Portland, Oregon, who are the beta testers of this, who are working on their 30-year plan uh, about their green belt, about their, sustainable, about their sustainability agendas, about their urban transportation agendas. Um, basically, the question is, what happens if you build more bike lanes? Um, how does it change you know, adoption curves? How does it change, what is the relationship between this and obesity? Um, the software, by basically the sort of you know, large-scale smart city uh, uh, promise, you know, that we will have sensors everywhere in people's phones, embedded in the pavement, all this. We'll create enough data that will help you make better decisions. And these are the kind of decisions that will help you make. They're very modest. They're very, these are the sort of top-down planning decisions that get made in urban planning departments all the time. And they're good because it helps us see relationships between data that we never saw before. This is the big data revolution that you were reading about in the New York Times Magazine this weekend. And we won't always use it to figure out who's pregnant shopping at Target. Um, and sort of the last slide of that is, you know, this is sort of the same you know, relationships that I talked about here, is that we know, and, we, and people are building this all the time, you know, that there's relationships between healthy populations, cycling, diet, number of green markets, all this sort of thing like that. The question now is, is, is how do we build the data models that we can actually prove this? Because if you could muster the data and you could show these relationships, you can sell it to skeptical voters, and you can also plan for it more efficiently. There's no reason to use the sort of 1960s era tools that we associate with Robert Moses and the planet who went and carved out neighborhoods. Um, the top-down tools of, of smart cities and ex-cities are really sort of bottom-up emergent. They are taking the data patterns that are there all around us and consolidating it in a sort of central authority who's empowered, who has the leadership and the vision to actually make this a reality rather than sort of, you know, groping towards a, an ultimate solution. And with that, I will turn it over to the loyal opposition.
<laughs> All right, well done. I think somewhere in Greg's bio it says that he was like the tri-county debate champion, so um, I kind of got the deck stacked against me, but let me give it a shot. All right, so I'm gonna, in the honor of the, oh, the political, hacked, right? yeah, in the honor of the political season, I'm gonna go straight for the jugular. This man is in bed with IBM. Um, he beat Jeopardy three times, or sorry, he beat Watson at Jeopardy three times. He wrote a great article about it, but I think it was rigged. So there's, there's an there's an inside job going on here somewhere. Um, but let me talk about a totally different um, way of looking at, at what's going on with this, this top-down approach. This is all about. Um, rewiring the city behind the scenes, um, behind, beyond the prying eyes of citizens, watchdogs. Uh, that, that model in Portland um, that, that IBM created, you can't go online and use that model. That model is only for city planners. Um, it, there's no documentation of the data that was put into it. There's no transparency about the algorithms. It's essentially a, a black box. Um, and in fact, it's built using the exact same methodology of systems dynamics approaches which were tried in urban planning 30, 40 years ago and found very, very much wanting. The biggest conclusion that came out of that uh, Portland uh, model last summer um, was that adding more bike lanes gets people to bike more, which is good for reducing carbon, but it also is good for addressing obesity. Now, did we need this systems model of Portland and all the data and all the effort that went into it to, to figure that out? I mean. You know, a first year urban planning student could, could figure out that those consequences would happen. Um, so I think this is, this is one of the big problems is that it's a lot of decision making, a lot of uh, decisions that get made behind the scenes using these tools without any citizen input. It's also basically just rejiggering and reinventing the world that we already have, which um, as Greg made a very good case is inherently unsustainable. There's no major social change. Um, it's sort of tinkering, it's a band-aid um, to fix the problems that we have, which are, are not, um, they're not trivial in nature, they're systemic in nature, so we need, we need new systems, not reinvented systems. Uh, and then just, I think the overall um, goal of these projects and this approach is questionable. Um, Craig admitted it's, it's all about efficiency. It's about control. Um, and again, it's about convenience. It's about um, you know, taking, uh, taking hard choices and, and making them invisible and pushing them into the background when we don't actually have to make them and we can maintain the standard of, of life that we have. I think the, that there's another vision that's been kind of bubbling up from the grassroots. Uh, it's not pushed by big companies, it's pushed by entrepreneurs, by citizen hackers, people that um, are interested in taking technology and using it to solve urban problems, but a different set of technologies not necessarily um, systems models or uh, massive centralized data mines or mass uh, citizen surveillance, um, but rather things that empower people um, to be more sociable, that allow um, various different parts of the city to be more transparent, particularly the uh, public sector parts, and to have fun doing it and to um, not make life efficient, more efficient, but to make it more pleasurable and more, more uh, happy and, and healthy. Um, and so I'm surprised that Greg didn't, didn't use this term industrialize the internet because it's, it's one that um, Steve Lohr at the New York Times has picked on sort of a piece of industry jargon um, and IBM has really been pushing that, that, you know, the internet up until now has been about connecting people and now we're going to connect things, everything on the earth, we're going to industrialize the internet. Um, and I think if we're going to industrialize the internet, we don't need Cisco and IBM to do it. We need a people's computer company. Um, and this is a great piece of Silicon Valley history. Some of you may have heard of the Homebrew Computer Club, which was a, a club that formed in the 70s in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley. So, you know, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak met there. There were lots of people who shaped the, the PC industry, which was considered at the time a revolution. The idea that computers weren't things that only lived in corporate uh, basements or in, in government labs. Uh, and this was their first newsletter. This is the first newsletter, the, the People's Computer Company, which sort of was a group that, that formed a little bit before that. And that, um, you know, this is like this great, I had to crop the bottom, but it's like this ship sailing into the, the new horizon. Um, and it's a computers are mostly used against people instead of for people, used to control people instead of to free them. Time to change all that. We need a people's computer company. And to me, you know, this really describes the kind of gut reaction to, to this top-down industrial vision of smart cities that is driving people forward to create different kinds of things. And so um, instead of uh, uh, the, the built environment of the city um, being the sensing platform, 
so sticking surveillance cameras up on lamp posts or um, you know studs in the ground that will monitor passing cars or parked cars. They want to do things like empower citizens to be sensors. And I'm going to use a couple examples uh, from around the world as well. Um, this was a demonstration project done in Paris a couple of years ago. Um, the city of Paris only had 10 uh, air pollution monitoring stations, their official network. And this group basically built a watch. Um, you know, it was an internet connected watch. And they built 100 of them and sent um, a bunch of volunteers out on bikes, bicycles to create this really fine grained map of air pollution in, in one Paris neighborhood. And really just to demonstrate the power of empowering citizens as, as um, sensors. Uh, this is also happening um, in disaster areas all over the world. Uh, Ushahidi, which was an um, open source platform built um, actually for election violence monitoring in Kenya. Um, so you'd be able to text in, you know, there's a couple thugs over here at this polling station um, and they're blocking people from voting or intimidating people. It's now used in every disaster around the world um, to instantly stand up a um, citizen reporting center um, where people can send in messages about, uh, you know, bodies in rubble or resources are here or people need housing or tents. And this is the instance that was, that was set up after the, um, the Haiti uh, earthquake. Um, and just as you can make citizens the censors, um, the bottom up grassroots is also trying to turn them into the things that act upon the city. Um, so, you know, the dynamic is rather than all this information being pumped into city hall and then city government taking action, that people can actually coordinate their actions and take, take, uh, take precautions on behalf. So this is a great project that's being done by a, a designer here in New York City. It's called Don't Flush Me. And um, we have this terrible problem here in New York with the combined sewage uh, overflow uh, systems. So when there's too much rain, the storm sewers flood into, into the sewage system and it flushes all the sewage out into the rivers and um, you know, creates a lot of, of pollution, coastal pollution problems. Um, Re-engineering this through traditional you know, kind of top-down infrastructure techniques would cost hundreds of millions of dollars, which is why it hasn't been done. Uh, but this proposal was basically to take an open source sensing platform and stick it in some key parts of the system where you can see when that overflow is about to happen and then to light up a uh, LED on the top of toilets to tell people not to flush because it will, it will send sewage into. Um, and so this really shows that rather than um, through kind of top-down governance, you can actually change people's behavior <coughs> using more grassroots approaches so that you do actually change the way people use the city and use infrastructure rather than spending all this money to hack uh, together things that let us keep doing things the way we do. Um, it also lets citizens participate in government. This is a screenshot from uh, C Click Fix. Uh, which is kind of an app version of 311, which allows people to uh, not just uh, report potholes and broken fire hydrants, broken parking meters to government, but to, to actually create community on top of that so someone can add a thumbs up. They can basically like your report uh, if they have the same, the same problem. Um, and in Boston, Boston's built sort of their own version of this where they're actually encouraging people to go fix each other's problems. So the CIO of Boston, Bill Oates, <clears throat> loves to tell the story about um, how somebody reported that there was a possum in their trash can. And before they could even roll the animal con control truck, somebody else, a neighbor, had gone over and tipped over the trash can and then went on Citizens Connect and said, you know, tip the trash can over, possum scurried away, problem solved. <laughs> and you know, these thousands of dollars that the city would have had to spend resp responding to this stupid um, report, you know. <laughs> and it, not just did they save the money, but they actually you know, help create a sense of community. And you can never do that. Um, I guess the top-down approach would be to have some kind of sensor in the trash can that, you know, would like terminate the possum or, um, you know, robotically tip it over um, and have some real sophisticated infrastructure for doing that. Um, again, Citizens as, as Actuators, there's a great project that's been going on uh, at ITP for a couple of years over at NYU that's spun off, um, which is basically about creating, using a sensor and a communications network to um, create a community around a house plant. Um, and you know, it was basically a classic piece of what Clay Sharkey called situated software. It was a piece of software created for a very small group of users to meet a very specific need they had. Um, doesn't matter if millions of people um, you know, have to use it. It's not like uh, uh, a Facebook or one of these top-down interventions where you have to have scale for it to work. People can build this 
to solve very specific problems in very specific places. And it's, it's called botanicals. And you know, basically, if it was dry, it would tweet all of its followers and say, water me. And then <clears throat> after you watered it, it would tweet and say, thank you. And the community could sort of stand down um, and wait for the next, the next call from the plant. Um, Bottom-up approaches also build social capital. This actually was a project done by the same uh, woman who did botanicals, Katie London. Um, and uh, it was done in Macon, Georgia. It's called Macon Money. And basically, um, it was sort of a uh, social network game combined with um, uh, local currency. And so they had these bonds that they would split in two. And uh, the only way you could redeem that bond, which would be good for purchases at local stores, uh, was to find who had the other half of your bond. And to find that person, you had to go out and really network. And, um, you know, did you see the other half of, the, of this one? And people were doing it online, and then they would, they would find the other ha half of the bond, the bond holder, and um, cash it in. And this is now being copied all over the place. And you don't get this, um, you know, when you're optimizing um, infrastructure networks. This is, this is about taking technology and, and uh, building from the bottom up. Uh, it also empowers community development. So <clears throat> there's a really rich debate uh, right now about what IT means for cities in the developing world. Um, and uh, as much as it means, you know, the mayor of Rio sort of coming in and saving the favelas from, from, from God, basically, from the rains, uh, it's also about empowering people with tools to, to build capacity from the bottom up. And you know, there's a real reframing of, of slums right now from places that are problems to places that actually um, you know, lift people out of poverty and, and improve themselves and upgrade themselves over time. Uh, here in, um, in, uh, in Nairobi, um, uh, Kibera is the, one of the biggest slums in Africa. Um, but up until now, if you looked at it on a map, an official map, a Google map, it's basically, it doesn't exist. Like the road network stops. And it's really fun to go on Google Earth and just kind of click the satellite view on and off, and it goes from invisible to visible, because the satellite view shows this huge squatter city of 250,000 people, but the road map is just a big blank. And um, what Map Cabrera tried to do was use a small group of volunteers to go out and map all the assets in the community. This is an approach that's actually began in Chicago um, <clears throat> about 15 years ago. And it's really just the idea that there are a lot of assets in these communities. There's a lot of risks, but you can map both of those, and then those start to become a platform for asking government for more resources, for becoming part of the formal city planning process, which most slums in the world have never been part of. Um, and then there's, you know, um, empowering political change. I was really amazed to find out, you know, amidst all of the talk about social media in the Arab Spring, that it all started um, with Slim Amamu, who was an activist blogger in Tunisia, checking in to the um, Ministry of the Interior in Tunisia on Foursquare. And his friends all looked at it and said, oh my god, what is he doing at the Department of the Interior? <laughs> it just happened to be you know, where the secret police headquarters was, and the jail was in the basement. And that was sort of his sly way of alerting the whole international community um, that he had been arrested. And that was when things started to very quickly um, build in terms of international support and pressure um, for the movement there. Um, the other thing that bottom-up allows you to do increasingly is to roll your own infrastructure. Um, so to the point that Greg made about, um, you know, big companies have to provide this infrastructure. And indeed, you know, for much of the Arab Spring, uh, you know, it was running over Vodafone's network in Cairo um, and in Tunisia and, and elsewhere. Um, but you can also build your own. And I've been involved in New York City for a long time, for over 10 years now, setting up free Wi-Fi hotspots all over the city. And um, we did an event with the Architecture League. Mark Shepard, who, um, who helped us organize, I was here. And it was basically trying to rethink the relationship between the, the, the offices that we all work in, um, which you know, were sort of this arbitrary disconnect that happened between the, the work life of the street about 100 years ago, um, and public spaces in New York. And we, um, you know, we basically went to wirelessly connected spaces all over the city, brought our own printers, brought desks, chopped off uh, different pieces of, of the new street plazas to, to kind of claim that space back. And, and this is what happens when you have you know, cheap consumer technology that lets you build, um, build infrastructure like Wi-Fi. Um, and then you know, this is 10 years later, fast forward, and this is what public Wi-Fi is. It's powering the revolution. Um, on the left is Zaragoza, Spain, uh, where I was back in November. 
um, the May 15th movement, which was sort of the first wave of anti-austerity protests in Spain, um, took place in, in uh, Plaza Pilar, which is like the, the main square in the center of Zaragoza. And um, the city, as part of its Digital Mile project, had been rolling out this whole network of free hotspots at the time. But they hadn't announced it, although they were in an open final beta. And all these people started pouring onto the network, right? And um, it, got, it got so, there was so much use, because so much of this revolution was playing out online, that um, the network started to bog down. People were tweeting you know, paranoid tweets that the city cut them off, the city cut them off. And so uh, a couple of the mayor's aides said, no, it's just, you know, you're overwhelming the network. Why don't you go down the street to this hotspot? There's another one down the street. And so the city sort of organized this um, allocation of people across this network of hotspots. Kind of the same thing happened uh, here in New York. Um, there were lots of reports of um, Occupy Wall Street protesters going up to the atrium at 60 Wall Street, which has free public Wi-Fi, ironically funded by the Business Improvement District. Um, inside the Deutsche Bank building on Wall Street. Um, so, and, and business improvement districts are funded by commercial property owners. So in a sense, all the Wall Street banks finance this piece of the, the revolution's infrastructure, which I thought was kind of a great recursive loop um, of top down and bottom up. Um, you know, I talked about situated software. I think Clay really nailed this. I was, I was sad that he didn't develop it further in his writings, but um, you know, the bottom up is more sensitive to context. And as urban designers and urbanists, that's what we're supposed to do. Um, the top down approach that industry is trying to cross fertilize all around the world is just about the worst way, I think, of doing um, urban design and planning. It's, it's the worst of kind of colonial importation of uh, ideas that have no, no basis in the context um, where, where you're working. Um, Clay defined so situated software as um, software designed for specific social group rather than a generic set of users. I don't think you can capture the difference between this top down and bottom up dynamic any, any more clearly than that. Um, and that's also a way of saying that the bottom up approach is more like Jane Jacobs. Um, I look at uh, Foursquare and I see, you know, all of these great like elements of New York City urbanism uh, being encapsulated and exported to the rest of the world. The mayor of Foursquare is Jane Jacobs' self-appointed public character, which she basically um, described as the guy on the corner who knew everyone and knew everything and kept the community together and kept an eye on things to make sure that social norms were being enforced without the need for all this top-down uh, governance. Um, and I just generally kind of have this, um, you know, love for the fact that the same thing can be can appear and sort of function so differently in so many places, and that. These ideas can spread without the need for a company um, or you know, a single advocate. If you just look at trains, right? Trains, they're all basically the same thing. They're a motorized car that runs along a set of rails. Uh, but they've evolved in so many different ways that aren't just about functionality, they're also about style and culture and what's important. Um, you know, New York, we just don't want to spend a lot of money on our infrastructure, and that's you know, why the Redbirds were running like 50 years um, for 50 years when they should have been put away. Um, Japanese, you know, wanted to have a, a symbol of the future, so they built a Shinkansen. I don't know what the Russian um, trade designers were thinking, but they're certainly fun to look at. Um, the other thing, too, about bottom-up smart cities is they're just a lot more fun to make. Um, there's always beer involved. People are always talking. It happens in the open. Um, it's creative. It's multidisciplinary. Um, I don't think that's going to go away. I think that's sort of embedded in the DNA of, of how this happens. Uh, and I've been toying around with this idea of it's what I call civic laboratories as a way of thinking about not, not just physical spaces like this, but sort of cities as test beds for smart technology uh, in ways that are uniquely local uh, and maybe exported to other cities like bike sharing and bus rapid transit and things like that, more, but not, not completely. Uh, and again, uh, like everything else, bottom-up smart cities are, are more bigger in China. Um, so uh, Shanghai has just announced a plan to build 100 hack spaces all around the city, which are going to be sort of combination um, fab lab uh, uh, design shops. And the idea, basically, is to invent all the things, the next generation of, of things that uh, will power smart cities. And this is, this is definitely not a top-down exercise. Some of these things may be harvested and scaled up by big Chinese companies, like Huawei, which is 
um, sort of you know going for Cisco's jugular right now on a global basis, and I'm sure Greg could talk more about that. Um, but uh, you know, I think this is this is the scale of things. And um, I mean, just, you know, in terms of metaphors, I think the best way to think about this is, is um, the Cambrian explosion. So up until um, about 500 million years ago, life on Earth was very, very simple. There weren't very many multicellular organisms. There, you know, life was basic. And then all of a sudden, this um, moment in evolution happened where basically all the phyla that we have um, developed and thousands, hundreds of thousands of new species emerged very quickly. And life got very complex very quickly. And I think this is, this is a good metaphor for what's happening now with computing technology. It's moving from very sim simple basic species on the desktop and getting stimulated and remixed in the real world. Um, and you know, it's not going to be a single ur urban operating system. It's going to be lots of different organisms competing in a, in a very complex wild. Um, so, which one of these will prevail? We'd love to hear what you guys have to think, and thanks for your patience. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, let me hand you this one. Um, I'd love to just kick off a, a Q&A with just two really brief questions, and then um, go ahead and just throw it out to anyone that wants to, um, yeah, to, 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 to question these guys. Um, I, I guess I have a, a one each for, for both of you. Um, I'll go back to Greg. Um, uh, with the first question, um, I, I think it's interesting that um, you know of, of the terms uh, uh, it, or of the words in the phrase "smart cities" that you know the, it's, it's the smart term that's kind of under under interrogation. Um, it's the one that you replaced by X, and uh, it's the one that was was most focused on. But I guess I'm curious about if you were to look at it a different way, and instead of looking at it as X cities, if you were to look at it as smart X, or to think, what is it that makes cities cities, and what is it that could be potentially quote unquote smart, um, and where could these networks uh, extend to? So I guess I'm curious about um, that idea that you know there's. What does it mean to be urban, and what does it mean to extend the smart network outside of an urban context? Because you have a smart periphery, because you have, a, um, you know, smart ruralism, so to speak. You know, where, where are the other? What are the other possibilities for the kinds of top-down planning that you're talking about that don't, in fact, involve large concentrations of people or architecture? And what kind of what form would those networks take? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess I guess the thing that comes immediately to mind is is um, now now that I can perhaps drop my, my total defense of, of IBM and others, although I have took elaborate notes to rebut Anthony there. Um, I mean, the, one of the where the areas, the intersection, the intersection of, of, of urbanism and technology to me is, is, um, is a, a phrase that I like to use, I like to call serendipity as a service. Um, because it, it combines a couple of things. One, serendipity is regarded as sort of the heart of what ur I think urbanity is. is it's in, the city brings together essentially strangers to create serendipitous encounters that enrich our lives, whether it creates innovation, which is the whole focus of Ed Glazer and that very tiresome camp who focus purely on cities where innovation happens. We need to build better cities, um, which is sort of, I think, monofocused in its own way. Um, but to me, to me, that's sort of, if you want to boil it down to one thing that is the essence of urbanity is that you create combinations that otherwise you never would have had because we are in such tight space and we're in an urban form that is designed to accommodate our interactions with each other. At least a good city does that, like New York. Um, but then what, what happens is when you add is, is when you combine that urbanity with the technologies that are being developed now, uh, big data on one hand, you know, mass aggregation of data, um, and then you combine that with sort of the algorithms that are being generated by places like Foursquare and other technologies along with our cell phones, what you're, what you're going to end up doing is I think the, the sort of the enhanced, enhanced urbanity that we have is that computing technology big data and mobility is going to merge with the city and it's going to lead you to serendipity as a service. That I like to imagine that in 10 years, you're going to see through some sort of cross-pollination through various networks, your Facebook profile, your LinkedIn profile, your OkCupid mobile dating uh, matching, which you know, if you've ever seen that app shows like you know your compatibility, your enemies, and your friendship compatibility, um, and we'll combine that with various sort of you know your purchase histories, geolocation, everything else, um, and you'll have an app on your phone that you'll pay a pretty penny for it that will say within three meters of you because GPS isn't exact, um, within three meters of you is this person, and will send a photo, and here's how you might know them, and here are your connections, and here's why it would be good for you to meet them, um, because that is the sort of that is the sort of you know computer enhanced version, that, you know. I could see this, the extension of your of your sense um, to basically bring it together. And that and that's something where, yeah, you don't need massive amounts of new architecture, you don't need thousands of people in a place. Um, that is something where basically, you know, that's where the technology and the and the city is combining there to enhance your ability to meet new people. And of course, you know, that will require those services knowing everything about you, literally, um, which creates its own power dynamic. But you know, is is that something I could interest you in? I'm, I think I think many people it could. 
page did you say you wanted to jump on that really quick? Yeah, no, I just, um, I think the, that phrasing of it as smart X, that's really how industry has been approaching it. They know nothing about cities. Now, IBM just hired their first urban planner last year. Okay, this is a company that is projecting a $10 billion market by 2015 in smart, smarter cities, and they have one planner on staff to explain to them, you know, this is how you know, City Hall makes decisions, this is how um, constituents voice their concerns, and you need to actually incorporate these things. I've had um, you know, people in different city governments tell me that um, I've seen nothing but missteps from, from, from these companies in terms of, um, you know, they'll do a study on how to use IT to re-engineer the city government, and it will mention the mayor once. Whereas actually everything flows from the mayor, so um, you know those, that that perspective. I think there's there's lots of good dialogue on that in the industry journals. If, if we want to bring it in, well, well, that, well that's just to jump on that. I think that's because the software industry sees uh, sees urban governments as having failed, or they see them as saps. I mean, it's part that's probably the whole arrogance of the technology culture. And you know, one of the one of the people that I hope we'll have here is Steve Lewis of Living Planet, although I don't, he doesn't cross the Atlantic that open. Um, but yeah, but he basically sort of sneers at the construction industry, the urban planning industry. It's very much a whole culture of you know, it, it's a combination of software and consulting. We'll come into your city and we will fix it because you people have screwed up and we we have God on our side. We have Moore's Law and we have software. Um, and that really is, like, it, it's smart anything. It's smart X in the sense of not even they don't know what the city is. To them, they're going to put smart into literally everything because that is how they build their next business model. Uh, when, you know, when, when sensors are that cheap, you're going to stick them everywhere and they're going to try to monetize everything. Yeah, I think, I mean, just an example of, of that sort of... Uh, the becoming smart of everything, or everything from uh, oceanographic networks to uh, embedding sensors in national, excuse me, natural processes, whether it's on the backs of insects or even in the, the kind of the tree farms that you were showing earlier. So there's a, um, an, a, a creeping out of the network into radically unurban landscapes. Um, but Anthony, then I, just a quick question for you um, before before I get out of the way here. Um, I, I think it was interesting listening to you speak. I, I remember a friend who uh, is sort of goes back and forth between game design, interaction design, and technology, and um, he, he tweeted once, uh, with, he had gone to MoMA to see Talk To Me with his mother. Uh, Talk To Me was the show that had all the interactive objects that you can uh, you know, register, uh, similar to the botanicals thing that you showed. Um, but basically he was saying that you know, for him it was kind of this exhilarating experience, for his mother it was just terrifying. Suddenly every object in her life was making demands of her, and she was, uh, it was kind of the nightmare of participation. Suddenly, my god, my plant is tweeting at me and I have to, I have to water it. Suddenly all the, the, the world has demands that it didn't have 10 years ago. Um, so I guess I'm curious about, you know, with all the examples that you showed, to some people, perhaps even including myself, it's the idea that we are compelled to participate at all scales always in the rolling out of our own infrastructure, and that suddenly now the, the weight of the world is on us individually. I guess I'm curious about how one accounts for that in the bottom-up approach to smart cities, where yeah, everyone is, is, is uh, ensnared in this kind of uh, infrastructural project. I mean, I think the answer to that is, is urban design, um, and I've been hammering on this for years that urban designers and architects have not been engaging with this technology in the way that they should. So, I mean, basically what you're saying is that we need, we need filters for that flow of information, and um, sort of the professions of place, I think, have a very powerful set of tools to, to, to wield in terms of structuring how that information flows. So, you know, do you just get stuff that's emanating from the place around you or the building that you're in or certain parts of your social network? And most of those discussions and decisions have been left to, to interaction designers and they're making very different choices because they come from a very different tradition. So, and I think the idea that you need to have some kind of integrated design approach or design profession that can kind of wield information technology and physical urban design at the same time and create really these very kind of crafted solutions, the way you would design a good building to really respond to its surroundings and its context. Like we just don't have that. It's very slowly emerging, but I think, I think that's what you need. You need people that can create those filters the same way that they're going to create filters for the flow of people and resources and things like that. But isn't that top down? It is, but it's it's just, very, it's just, at a very small scale. Yes. <laughs> First blood. Well, I mean, I think that the return to planning, the return to planning that you described is a very archaic view of planning. It's not um, sort of the advocacy or engagement planning that has basically took over in the, in the wake of, of the big failures of urban renewal in the 60s, well, well, which was all about empowering people to participate in decision making and planning and using your expertise to give them choices and you know, winnow things down, but not make the decisions for them. 
Well, which also sort of denies our expertise. I mean, I, I was thinking that particularly on the Tom Campanella essay that he wrote like a year ago on this, where like the planning has been so diminished. Like planning was destroyed by the Jane Jacobs, Robert Moses thing. And like they are, they are facilitators now and, and instead of planning it themselves. I don't know, I just thought it was interesting. But th this is, this is a notion of like they will have the tools back at their disposal. And the, hopefully the other, they'll use it more wisely. The other thing to point out is how different this is in different parts of the world. And, and we both flipped very casually back and forth between um, you know, poor developing countries, rich, rich, getting rich developing countries, and the rich developed world, and uh, the technologies available, the urban problems, and, the, and the, the, the government planning regimes are so different in all those things that they're, and that's why I think like the one top-down answer just doesn't work because it's, every city's gonna have different needs and different resources. Hey guys, um, no, I have to speak out. Um, so, really like, the points, uh, thank you very much. One of the things that came to mind when you were speaking is obviously there's that phrase, if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go far, go together. But you made it kind of evidently clear that, you know, between uh, the climate change crisis, et cetera, we might not have time uh, for there to be this kind of organic growth. So how would you then look at the government's kind of, as, or there's the top-down planners as the mechanical platform or the physical platform, how would you capture all the different ideas you had and kind of put them in front of those planners so that they're best situated. So for example, some things might work best in Asia. You mentioned many great ideas that might not work best in the US. Is there kind of more of a hybrid approach that you guys see or is it kind of? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, so another good rebuttal point for Greg is if you look at um, you know, <laughs> what Paul Hawken wrote um, in Blessed Unrest a few years ago, he was talking about the grassroots response to, to global warming. And he made the claim that there's basically a million organizations that have formed in one shape or another around the world to, to fight global warming. And he, he saw that as, as the real um, you know, parallel to the environmental movement in the 60s that was actually going to do something substantial about the problem. Um, clearly, they've still not succeeded at getting it on the top-down agenda um, in, every, in every circumstance. But I think you know, that's sort of the model. It's like this mass grassroots uprising. Um, but with, he didn't talk about was cross fertilization, and there's there's two organizations that I know of right now in particular, well three actually, that are doing cross fertilizing these good grassroots ideas. Um, Code for America is the one that's operating here in the U.S., um, funded by a whole bunch of different foundations, including Google and Rockefeller. Um, they're putting it's basically Teach for America, but for 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 software geeks. They go into city halls, they solve problems for mayors very quickly. They, they're a big end run around like really rigid procurement practices that is what you know allows IBM and Siebel and all these big companies to win every government software contract. Um, and they're also creating culture change in the cities that they work in. Uh, another one is called Living Labs Global. And this is basically like a big online shopping mall for, for smart solutions. And um, they're trying to put together a database of 5,000 different, these aren't so much like super grassroots, like you know, a hacker activist, but they're just small businesses that are trying to compete with IBM's and Cisco's. Um, and they've had some limited success. And then the UN is trying to do it in the developing world with something called Global Pulse, which is trying to come up with um, data indicators uh, of social and economic crisis. So, um, you know, if people all of a sudden stop topping up their, their mobile airtime minutes, that's an indication, or they start topping off once a week instead of once a month in smaller amounts, that's an indication that there may be some kind of economic crisis going on at the micro level that they can't see in, in government statistics. And they're coming up with all these different ideas about data sources you might track in any one country and then sharing them with other countries. Um, so I think that like cross-fertilization, we've got to get better at sharing these ideas and faster than we did with like bike sharing, which took five years to spread around the world, or bus rapid transit, which took like two decades. Um, it's just not, it's just not going to work otherwise. Um, I think one thing that's odd to that is one, one the, 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 the biggest hole in your argument for, for bottom up, I think, is, is the examples because, or at least intentions, because, uh, because yeah, I mean, see, click fix is great, but like tipping over, all right, so you've tipped over my possum can. Like in the meantime, the world is burning down. What are you doing for that? The bottom up has a problem with dealing with that large scale. At least we'll feel like we belong. Yeah, yeah. exactly. See, there's that view of it. And then I guess the practical question, the, the, hybrid, the hybrid model, which the industry is pursuing, Cisco, and I've seen this, and this may be because they, they're doing whatever succeeded five minutes ago, which is the app store model. 
model. The App Store model is the approach to doing smart cities. If Cisco and IBM have their way, what will be is like they will provide a, a, a shiny, beautiful platform, and yes, it will be closed to some extent. But like, but you can build out urban apps for it, and you can build you know C Click Fix and whatever else you want on their platform, and they will just take 30% of your revenue. And like, which is which to them is just awesome because they don't even have to do that work. So, so like a really like dystopian way of looking at it, the C Click Fix example is. You know, if we are doomed and governments are doomed to collapse along with the rest of society, things like see click fix are gonna lay the foundation for whatever comes next, right? I mean, they're capacity they're capacity building tools. They're you know the world may burn, but at least we'll have a sense of togetherness that we can use to <laughs> until the grid cuts out, yeah. Well but one of the things that I think is always so interesting is, is about the bottom up approach is it's so popular in America where everyone refuses to give up one tiny shred of freedom for anything that might like improve society as a whole. Like worse things are done in the name of freedom every day in this country than like yeah and so it's curious to me that like you started by saying we need to change systems. Like this is not like we don't need to reinvent system. But I feel like the bottom up approach often in America is just like another way to enact the same old like frontier, we'll do it all our way on our own and no one will tell us what is best, you know, and we don't actually have to cooperate with anyone other than the, the, the people's, the filter that we, that we'll set up. So I, I don't know whether, I mean, the, obviously it's tempting to be a bottom up because you, you can feel warm about everything, but, but um, and it's easy to see the dystopian ramifications of top down, especially in the hands of corporations rather than government per se, but, you know, I, I don't know, I feel like there are, People, people, don't let us talk amongst ourselves. Any other thoughts here? Here, please, dive in here. You had your hand up first. Okay. Yeah, you, yeah, you were the first to get that one uh, hand up. So yeah, okay. You know. Well, yeah, okay, two things, really. I'm going to try to be really quick, um, just sort of laying them out there. Maybe you guys can you know, them out a bit. One, this, uh, this whole question of, sort of ubiquitous computing and the future, the city of tomorrow, the, smart cities aren't here yet is kind of interesting to think about in relation to the history of ubiquitous computing itself. And Mark Weiser projects this coming day, uh, 20 years in the future. It was in the context of an article titled The Computer for the 21st Century. And you know, um, Paul Durish and Jenny Bell wrote an essay you're probably familiar with. Uh, which you know, basically says, well, it's the 21st century, and you know, we're now living in that age which uh, Wiser projected. Um, but uh, so, you know, what do we make of this whole project of ubiquitous computing? And th their argument was basically, well, oh, ubiquitous computing is already here. It's just arrived in ways that um, Wiser didn't imagine originally, which was this kind of unified, centralized system, uh, which was purely and effortlessly interoperable. Um, so they create an argument which is that it's actually a much messier condition, uh, that it's actually here now, right? And that, um, uh, and then I think this is the most important point, is that uh, the argument about the future, that this is coming tomorrow, is, act is actually a ploy that uh, enables one to galvanize uh, um, uh, resources toward producing something which, you know, the kind of technical details, the messy questions of interoperability are kind of kicked down the line for um, uh, the next generation, the implementers to, to manage. So that's the first question. What's the difference between uh, today's visions of smart city and Visor's visions of ubiquitous computing and how they both project the kind of centralized universal? The second uh, then is to say, do, does this top-down, bottom-up structure really help? Right? Are, or are we maybe more talking about the relationship between, say, a sort of strategic approach versus a tactical approach? Both of you, in your presentations, identify moments where uh, what's being characterized as top-down have uh, bottom-up aspects to it, uh, uh, bottom-up. Uh, relying on platforms or systems which are produced by top-down organizations. Um, so this hybrid approach is something which maybe is better understood in terms of strategic versus tactic, where strategic is able to view its object of uh, um, uh, interest uh, from practice distance, where the tactical can't separate itself from it, right? You know, where it's actually uh, is, is working hand-in-hand. 
Can I just respond real quickly? Yeah. Um, to the first, the first statement. Yeah, I mean the, that first line. It's here, right? I mean, I don't. I am familiar with the essay you mentioned, and I, I found it kind of obvious. Um, the second thing is that in 15 years of talking about this, the top-down, bottom-up dynamic has been the most, by far, the most effective at getting non-experts in technology and people outside the field, um, lay people, citizens, engaged in that there actually is something big at stake. Um, and usually I go even like a level further in like clarifying it. I say this is just like the battle over highways. Like we are on the brink of ruining our cities for another century on top of this colossal mistake we already made because we're letting IBM Cisco take the place of GM and tell us how to build our cities. And it, it's dramatic oversimplification, but at least gets people thinking about the trade-offs and the risks. And nobody, like very few voices, I think, are, are, are giving it that sort of clarification right well, now. That's strategic. Well, I was saying, well, my, 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 my response is to take the second half of it. My question is, is who's actually doing the strategic thinking in this scenario? Because the, because the governments have no ability to invest in this. There's never going to be a public, I mean, public build out of any of the technology. So we'll all have to go to the major, you know, go to in the basis level to the telcos and like uh, the guts of that, all of whom are operating on a quarter to quarter basis. Um, so no, I, I don't know, A, I don't know who's doing any strategic thinking whatsoever. And then B, it still gets back to like, I was thinking of the wiser. I mean, like no one ever built those protocols because I mean, the technology, a was invisibly good enough at the time, or, or B, you know, they just simply couldn't. I, I don't know. They couldn't. They couldn't deliver. They couldn't deliver a unique selling proposition ultimately to it. Um, you know, you can't. Uh, I don't know. I always think of like. The, I mean, I think of tablets now. I mean, what is what is what is the protocol? How did Apple design the t the touch screen in that? I mean, at some at some level, that is a proprietary software they developed for this complete device. And this is after 20 years of trying to build tablets. I mean, I love Jerry Kaplan's Go. I mean, I read that now, being like, wow, I can't believe we're finally in this era. And uh, you know, and that required some proprietary. That required a lot of proprietary investment, proprietary software, and on top of that now is a whole universe of uses for tablets that we're seeing go wider and wider and wider. Um, so there is a whole like notion of like where is it appropriate for the company to reap the benefits for us to have the services on top of it in a city context, in a smart city context. I don't know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if there's an Apple of smart cities. That would be Apple. Well, probably, like all their other products would be layered on top of like millions of man hours of open source code. Oh, of course, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I want, to, I want to build on that and, and ask the question of ownership. Like who owns? The, the network, who owns the data, who owns the conclusions that come from the data, you know, I mean, especially when we're talking about, I mean, if, if we're talking about like top down, you know, stick with this paradigm, um, it's, it's easy to say, well, that's just black box, then it's behind, you know, the, the uh, firewalls of, you know, corporate IP law and stuff like that. Um, but even if you're talking about bottom up stuff, uh, where does that data reside? How uh, fungible, how, how appropriable is it? Um, I mean, I, I think there's going to be something really, there's going to be a huge tsunami of, of, of shit that's just going to break over this country with um, the, uh, the drones and the, the FCC just you know, is now legalizing that anybody can fly a drone. Um, I mean, first it's going to be you know, local governments and you know, but, but as of September, it's going to be anybody can fly a drone under 400 feet.